my Western Civ. <clears throat> We're gonna do the next set of notes. Try to finish everything in this uh, 20 minute period, but if not, then I'll, I'll do another one. All right, so we uh, talk about some of the situations uh, in Europe post-war. One of the big ones, obviously, was the discovery of the Holocaust. Uh, as the German forces were occupying Poland in 1939, they began destroying the native Polish Jewish population, which was the largest in Europe. 10% of Poland's population uh, when the war started was Jewish, okay? They're gonna wipe out the Polish upper classes, many of the post-war leaders, 1918 post-war leaders. Um, some escaped exile. Uh, they did set up a new Polish government in uh, London uh, after 1939. Uh, but Hitler will set up his extermination camps in Poland. There's a famous picture of the railroad going into Auschwitz. And there's the famous sign, Arbeit macht frei, or work will set you free, which of course we know is a lie. You were never going to be set free if you went there. Um, Hitler had mentioned in Mein Kampf removing the Jews. He even mentioned at one point shipping them to Madagascar, the island off the coast of Africa. But as we talked about at the uh, 1942 meeting in Wannsee, the Wannsee Conference, they outlined the final solution to the Jewish question, as they called it, and began the process of setting up the extermination camps. Now, unlike Germany, remember we talked about how German Jews really felt assimilated and didn't understand why Hitler hated them so much, the Polish Jewish population was not assimilated. They had been treated horribly uh, by Poles, uh, during the interwar period. And so um, when they rounded up the Jews, a lot of Poles helped the Nazis do that, uh, thinking it would get them in their good graces. So when the Nazis first conquered Poland, they actually wanted to put the Polish Jewish population in um, a ghetto in this town right here called Lublin, which is along the eastern border. Um, but they will end up setting up ghettos in uh, Polish cities like Warsaw and Lodz. Uh, the ghettos, in fact, the term ghetto comes from uh, Hebrew, and it was basically a separate living area. In this case, uh, separate parts of towns or even right outside of towns would be uh, set up for Jews. And then in 1944, the Jews in Warsaw's ghetto actually started an uprising uh, as the uh, Soviets were moving in, the Red Army. And from what we know, uh, <clears throat> they were ordered to stand down. They were actually ordered to stand down outside the city until the uprising was put down by the Nazis because they didn't want to deal with a uh, population that was rebellious. So by 1942, millions will be shipped off. 20% of the ghetto residents will die of malnutrition and disease. Only about 10% of Poland's Jewish population survived the war, so only 10% of that 10%. Um, <laughs> most of them will leave for the U.S. or for Israel after the war. And again, for Poland, um, the Holocaust was especially harsh because, again, all the death camps were located either on its soil or what would become its soil. All right, so again, the explanations of the Holocaust, and it may surprise us, but, you know, Hitler... Um, <clears throat> was not the first person to, uh, you know, make hateful statements about Jews. We talked about that throughout the Dreyfus Affair in France. I mean, European Jews had been treated horribly uh, for centuries. Hitler was just the first one to take that into uh, account and create a state-sponsored mass execution program. He was trying to wipe out every single Jew. Okay. At the same time he was doing this, Stalin and Mao were also causing deaths in their respective nations, just not based on ethnicity or religion. Okay. So what are the effects of the Holocaust? Well, one, uh, the push for a homeland for Jewish people, which had been ongoing for 50 years, would finally reach fruition. And two, much of the Jewish population of Europe will leave. So the numbers of Jews in Europe, which had been very high for centuries since the diaspora, um, you know, after uh, biblical times, uh, that population will leave. So Europe's Jewish population drops very, very low because for Jews, it's safer either to be in America or to the new Israel that's being created in the Middle East. All right, so during the war, uh, what's going on in each of the, we're going to talk about the domestic front. So during the war, um, Hitler was again focused on Lebensraum, the living space. Um, the first two years of the war, the economy was booming, goods were plentiful. And then America entered the war and the Eastern Front bogged down. This is the food minister, Albert Speer. And he will change uh, from a you know, consumer uh, military mixed economy to a military economy only. 
And so that same year, uh, government will put in rationing. The military production will actually increase during those middle three years of the war, but as men were drafted into service, that growth will stop, okay? And so by 1943, the labor that they needed was in very short supply. Men, women, and teenagers were being drafted into the Wehrmacht. And so this is when the Nazis started shipping in POWs, uh, people they had captured. Uh, they used Slavs, they used Russians, they used some Jews. Uh, they even used American and British pilots that had been shot down and soldiers they had captured. So um, you, if you had been captured by the Nazis, it was highly possible you could become a slave as a slave laborer. Uh, the Nazis did value the female. Remember, they were all about the purity of the Aryan race, um, and they wanted to maintain that support on the home front. But again, they were unable to prevent women from working because, again, they needed it. Uh, propaganda was important. This guy right here was the propaganda minister, Paul Joseph Goebbels. Okay, um, he was uh, he had become propaganda minister when Hitler took power in thirty three. And he will use uh, radio, he will use movies, um, <clears throat> he will exaggerate the claims of victory. So whenever there's a victory by the Nazis, they would say how great a victory it was. But anytime there was something bad, they would minimize it. Uh, they denied the effectiveness of strategic bombing, told people that you know the bombing isn't really accomplishing anything. And then once we get to the, uh, the round-the-clock bombing, the, the daylight and nighttime bombing, um, Goebbels actually benefited from that because, again, he could claim that the enemies were trying to exterminate the Germans. Not that the Germans had done anything bad, but that they were just being bombed because you know, the British and the Americans were evil. Uh, there's very few anti-Nazi groups. That's always been a big question. You know, did anyone oppose Hitler? Uh, one was the White Rose Group, and this is from a movie that was made about them. Uh, Anti-Nazi intellectual group. They were actually students. Most of them were teenagers. Uh, they were arrested when somebody snitched on them. A person that they thought was their friend snitched on them, and they got arrested. They were tried, and they were executed uh, very horrifically. But that group today is seen as student heroes. Um, I likened it in class to, have you ever seen the movie Red Dawn? You know, when the Soviets invade and the American high school kids become guerrilla fighters? Yeah, that's kind of what the White Rose Group is. Um, a year later, we have another group, uh, Nazis, many of whom had supported Hitler from the beginning, but by this point, believe that Hitler um, has lost, you know, his uh, ability to lead. And so... Um, group was led by a uh, nobleman, uh, Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, and it was termed Operation Valkyrie. The plan was to leave a briefcase bomb at a meeting that Hitler was, in, was attending. Well, it was, and you can barely see it here, but it was a big, thick oak wooden table that was very tough, and the plan was to put the briefcase next to Hitler's leg. Well, it got moved, and so the briefcase bomb ended up on the other side of the um, of one of the wooden legs of the table, and that kept Hitler from dying. He was injured, but not severely. Okay. By the way, the uh, they made a movie about this called Valkyrie with Tom Cruise, and in the aftermath, a number of these leaders are arrested and tortured to death. Uh, I told the story in class. One of the famous ones is they they wrapped piano wire around their necks and they played the piano and slowly strangled them, and Hitler would watch the videos. So yeah, the Valkyrie group was treated horrifically when they were captured. All right, moving on to France. France is a tricky situation because they're going to create a puppet collaborationist government uh, during the war. So um, today it's still very controversial. Um, it's not an easy topic. A lot of French like to disavow this part. Um, the leader of France was Henri Pétain, and when the Germans invade and take over France, as you can see, they get all of the red area, all of the northern part, and then, of course, all of the Atlantic coast. The orange or the purple area was given over to the new government, which is called Vichy France, since they moved to the city of Vichy, which is like right there. Okay. Now, Patton claimed later that he did it to save what he could of France, that he couldn't save everything. And some people believe that, but a lot of Frenchmen believe that he was still a traitor. Um, the Nazis had taken three-fifths of the nation, and the other 40% went to Vichy. Um, Patton agreed to allow the rounding up of French Jews. They were sent to extermination camps, so French Jews were not safe. Uh, Vichy turned them over. 
The Catholic Church and the French conservatives actually supported Patton in the beginning because they felt that the nation had become too liberal. Okay? Now, in the middle of this, we're going to see a new leader emerge, kind of, Charles de Gaulle. Okay? Now, de Gaulle was a general. He was not a prominent individual, but when the government of France flees, he will become the leader of the Free French Government in London. And uh, they will use propaganda. They will promote uh, fighting between the Allies and the Vichy France government. He's hoping to get rid of them. And so the other issue we have is that the Vichy French forces were still stationed in southern France, which was still occupied, and in Africa. Okay? So the problem now is the British, the Free French, and the Americans um, you know, had to treat Vichy as an enemy because they were technically supporting Hitler. So there's a base in uh, Morocco called Mirs el Kabir, Mirs el Kabir, sorry. And um, when the Vichy forces refused to surrender, uh, the British bombed it and killed over a thousand French sailors. They also invaded the Western African bases of Senegal and Gabon. Well, Vichy France uh, told their soldiers to resist and said, you have to fight back, it is your duty. Well, when the Allies landed in North Africa during Operation Torch, most of the Vichy French forces did not fight back, but occasionally they did. So the Americans didn't know. When they encountered a Frenchman, they didn't know if he was, you know, a free French uh, guy who was going to fight with them or whether he was a Vichy French guy who was supposed to kill him. Um, another good example is that um, the Nazis actually moved in to the southern part of France to try to take the French naval fleet there, uh, the commander, Jean Darlan, actually blew up the ships rather than have them turned over. So um, Vichy France uh, fighting in the war, one of those stories you don't often hear, did happen. Um, a lot of French people joined the Resistance, which was the guerrilla group that operated inside the Vichy France government and also uh, the occupied Nazi part. Um, it was never more than 5% of the population, but they were heroes. Um, they rescued Allied pilots, they saved French Jews, tried to, they targeted Nazi officers and soldiers, and in the rural areas, they were called the Maquis. In the cities, they were called the Resistance. And they're seen as heroes today. Again, even though they weren't a large part of the population, uh, they resisted Vichy France. All right, so by 1944, the credibility was gone, de Gaulle was becoming more and more powerful. When the Allies landed at Normandy, um, the French actually aided the Allies. So we were concerned, you know, where were we going to get support? And when our soldiers would, you know, show up, uh, they'd get food handed to them and, you know, told information. So uh, most French people were happy to support the Allies by that point. Um, they were allowed to lead the liberation of Paris, which was a little controversial. The Americans wanted to do it, but de Gaulle asked if he could, and they said yes. Uh, by the end of 45, Patton government was over. He attempted to flee, but was captured. He would later be convicted and um, put in jail. He would not be executed, surprisingly. And I would argue that the reason he didn't get that was because uh, he had been a war hero in the First World War. Okay, uh, But there were other collaborators. His prime minister, Pierre Laval, tried and executed. Fernand de Brignon, who was the ambassador to Nazi Germany, tried and executed. And Joseph Darnon, who was the head of the Malice, or the secret police, kind of the French, Vichy French version of the Gestapo, he was also executed. So today, when we when they talk about Vichy France in French history, um, it's it's a little tricky. It's it's a controversial period. All right, Britain. They're going to be organizing for victory. Now, um, just be just before the fall of France. Uh, they had already voted out Neville Chamberlain. Uh, they will hand emergency powers to the new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. They include food rationing, compulsory military service, and economic controls like price wages and floors. Uh, Lord Beaverbrook was put in charge of the industrial production, including airplanes. And that's because the Nazis began bombing the British Isles during that summer of 1940. Uh, scrap metal recycling was instituted, factory hours were extended, women entered the workforce, and by the end of 41, the production had improved. British were actually surpassing Nazi Germany in terms of military uh, building. Uh, the air raids that the British were subjected to killed over 30,000 civilians. They devastated large parts of the island. That's important because when it came down to it, um, the British were more than willing to bomb German civilians, you know, claiming, hey, they bombed our civilians. 
Um, land that was available was given over to farming, and the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, was the one who handled the propaganda. All right, so the Soviets have a little tricky issue because they will have the biggest losses. Um, 16 million Soviet citizens will be killed. Large numbers of their soldiers were captured as POWs. Uh, the Western USSR was devastated by the fighting. Towns and cities were destroyed. And then remember, the Nazis would round up Russian people and send them back to Germany to work as slave laborers. So in the decade before the war, we talked about this, Stalin had remade the nation. Uh, he'd sent people to work camps in Siberia. He purged the military. He dealt with famine and disease. And again, he was not a very popular leader. When the war comes, though, he is going to, you know, resort to patriotism. He doesn't call it the, you know, communist fighting, you know, totalitarian war. He would say the great patriotic war. Because again, Soviet Union was invaded and, um, you know, Russian people were angry about this. They had been invaded and they wanted to fight back. All right, so Stalin first is going to move the industrial production to the cities and towns east of the Urals. And the Ural Mountains are a range just east of Moscow, uh, which kind of demarcates Europe and Asia. Uh, he will make peace with the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to get their support, even though he didn't like churches. And then during the early months of Barbarossa, as the Soviet troops got trapped behind Nazi lines, they became guerrilla fighters and they harassed the Nazi troops. Once the Soviets counterattacked, these partisan forces join the regular army and have lots of intelligence. So part of the reason that Hitler takes such a beating in uh, Western Russia was because of that. Now, the Red Army is heading westward towards Berlin. The Wehrmacht is overwhelmed. And in fact, in most cases, Soviets had to actually stop their offensive because they were overrunning their supply lines, not because the Nazis were stopping. And when the war ends, the Soviets are the only superpower capable, capable of challenging the hegemony of America. All right, so the preparations for peace. So the final years of the war, uh, we're going to see the stage set for the Cold War. Uh, Stalin wanted to ensure that the USSR would not have to worry about another invasion. They've been invaded twice in the last 30 years. British and Churchill again suspected what Stalin was doing, and they wanted to counter him. So before America even entered the war in uh, late 1941, before Pearl Harbor, um, FDR had held a meeting. He asked Churchill for a meeting in Newfoundland, in Canada. So the two of them will meet. There's pictures of them together. And they will draw up the Atlantic Charter, okay? And think of the Atlantic Charter as the World War II version of the 14 points. Post-war Europe was going to be based around self-determination. People would vote for what they wanted. There would be a new organization to replace the League of Nations. It would disband right after the war. And then again, because there was more than one front, we have a very uneasy alliance. We've got the US, the British, the Soviets, and then to a lesser extent, Canada, Free France, Australia, okay? All right, so the Allied plans. Again, the three nations there, quite an unusual alliance because again, um, they're not really getting, I mean, the British and the Americans get along fine, but none of the countries got along with the Soviet Union. So really it was a military uh, necessity. And so in 1943, all three leaders will get to meet for the first time in Tehran, Iran. Uh, Stalin wants the Allies to open that second front in Western Europe, and the Soviets were still trying to push the Nazis back. Uh, the Allies, by this point, had invaded Italy, but Stalin felt that that was, you know, just a mirage, that the Italian invasion would do nothing to help out him. And so he, again, um, wants the Americans to launch the, you know, D-Day on France, essentially. Uh, within a year, there's a big change. Soviets had pushed the Nazis back to present-day Poland. The Polish people had risen up in Warsaw. And, uh, again... That's when Stalin let the Nazis put the rebellion down. By late 1944, the Soviets were concentrating their efforts in the Balkans. All right, so the Soviets um, occupied Romania and Hungary. Winston Churchill decided on his own to go and visit Stalin, just the two of them, no FDR, okay? Um, he will go to Moscow in October. The British and the Americans were pushing towards the Western German border and they were discussing Europe. The two leaders agreed, and we, again, we don't know how much FDR knew about this, 
Um, he may not have known it all, or at least had a basic idea. Um, they agreed to split up the Balkans. The USSR would get Romania and Bulgaria to control. The West, meaning the British, would control Greece, and then the Allies would collaborate on what to do about Yugoslavia, Hungary, and then also Albania here, okay? So around that time, the Americans came around to the idea of dividing Germany up into occupation zones. Now, Stalin demanded 20 million reparations and he wanted forced labor from German civilians. Uh, both leaders said, no, we're not doing reparations, that's what ruined World War I, and we're definitely not doing slave labor because slavery is outlawed, okay? So the other problem is Stalin had placed a friendly communist government in Lublin while the free Poles back in London wanted to reestablish the capital at Warsaw. All right, so Stalin um, agrees that, you know, he needs to sell the idea of self-determination. He needs people to believe that he's not just trying to steal territory. So he will sign, uh, well, first of all, he will invite some of the uh, Polish leaders in uh, London to join the government in Lublin. And then he will sign the document Declaration of Liberated Europe, which promised self-determination. Now, the next leader or the me next meeting of the leaders would take place in Yalta in the Soviet Union. Now, this is in February of 45. At that point, the Allies had still yet to cross the Rhine. The Soviets were less than 100 miles from Berlin, but they had stopped because, again, they had overrun their supply lines again. So FDR is desperate. He is sure that he will need uh, the Soviets in the Pacific War. So he gives Stalin a lot. A free hand in the island of Sakhalin, uh, a free hand in the Kuril Islands, and concessions in Korea and Manchuria. Now, the meeting was actually very amicable, but Churchill was making moves to maintain the British Empire, and FDR pulled him aside and said, you can't do this. You realize that by doing this, you give um, Stalin a chance to take territory too, okay? So FDR will again, you, again press Stalin on the Poland issue, but gets very little progress. And that sets us up for Potsdam, okay? The Potsdam Conference. So uh, the big three will meet one final time in July of 1945 in uh, Potsdam, which is a suburb of Germany. But a lot has changed. As you can see in the picture here, Truman is the new U.S. president. FDR had died in April. And Clement Attlee was the new British leader. He had been voted, or he had taken over after Churchill was voted out of office, okay? Uh, the war in Europe had ended in May of 1945. The Americans were doing mopping up operations in Okinawa and were preparing to invade the Japanese home islands, okay? So the meeting was very tense from the beginning. One, because Truman um, had heard stories about, you know, Stalin's tactics and was not happy. Um, Attlee was largely uninformed, so he pretty much just followed Truman's lead. Um, but the big thing was they're going to divide up the border. They're going to hand the Poles uh, what is called East Prussia, that German territory that was separated after World War I. And then the western border of Poland will be moved 100 miles into formerly German territory along the Oder and Nice rivers. Okay? Germany will also be divided into four occupation zones, um, but number, numerous uh, European nations had not signed the treaties. They will have to make separate treaties uh, to get them to technically end the war, okay? Now, we'll come back to Potsdam a little bit when we talk about the Cold War, which is Unit 7.